Hello, um, my name is Angie D. Michelle, and I am a medical oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today about early stage hormone positive breast cancer and how we can optimize systemic therapy. Here are my disclosures. And today I will be covering uh, several important issues. First, the issue of adjuvant endocrine therapy. Uh, at San Antonio, we heard an update from the text and soft trials, as well as an Oxford overview meta-analysis of aromatase inhibitors versus tamoxifen for premenopausal women. I'll cover some updates on the Rxponder trial, as well as the final analysis of PALACE and how that fits into the final data from Monarchy. And with a little extra time, I'll also cover some new strategies for metastatic ER-positive breast cancer including the PADA-1 and Emerald trials. So let's get started first with adjuvant endocrine therapy. So here are the real ongoing debates in high-risk premenopausal women. We are still struggling with which is the better agent, tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. We also continue to wonder whether ovarian function suppression, or OFS, is always necessary when giving either tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. And finally, is the effect of adjuvant chemotherapy all due to induction of permanent amenorrhea, or is there an independent biological effect? So let's see what we learned at San Antonio this year. So first, let's talk about an update to the text and soft trials. Now, soft, text, and PERCH were three important trials that addressed many of these questions. The PERCH trial really asked the question of whether ovarian function suppression provided the same additional benefit as chemotherapy in premenopausal women. We don't have any data from this trial because it closed due to poor accrual. But we do have data from the SOFT and TEX trials. SOFT asked whether ovarian function suppression added to tamoxifen in women still premenopausal after chemotherapy. And both SOFT and TEX asked if ovarian function suppression is given, which agent is better? AI or tamoxifen. Now, all three of these trials launched in 2003. This is the 12 and 13 year follow up from soft and tax, respectively. And importantly, as you look at these data, remember that there were patients who were high risk, who are both node positive or received chemotherapy, and patients who were low risk, those who were node negative or did not receive chemotherapy. And here were the designs of the trials. First, uh, above, you see the text trial, which had 2,672 patients, two arms randomized to either tamoxifen with OFS or exemestine with OFS. Below, you see the soft trial, 3,066 patients, and these, this was a three-arm trial, randomizing patients to tamoxifen, tamoxifen plus ovarian function suppression, or exemestine plus ovarian function suppression. Again, these were all premenopausal patients and they could have received chemotherapy, but they did not have to. So first thing we saw was the overall survival benefit from ovarian function suppression. So when we look at these data, we see that uh, OFS, ovarian function suppression, provides a survival benefit when added to either tamoxifen or exemestine. And that benefit was about 2.3% absolute benefit for tamoxifen, 2.6% absolute benefit for exemestane, and this benefit was limited to just the high-risk patients. Secondly, when we look at which agent was better, we see that when given ovarian function suppression concurrently, exemestane provided a survival benefit over tamoxifen of about 3.3%. And again, this finding was limited to high-risk patients. Next, we saw data from the Oxford overview looking at aromatase inhibitors versus tamoxifen in premenopausal women with ER positive early stage breast cancer. This was the patient met uh, level meta analysis of 7,030 women in four randomized trials. These are the trials that were included. So, in addition to the soft and text trials, we also have the ABCSG 12 trial that had uh, 1,694 patients with a median follow-up of eight years, and the HOBO trial, which had 703 patients with a median follow-up of 5.3 years. You'll also notice that the data that was used in the soft and text trial analysis here 
is only at 9.1 and 7.9 years of follow-up. So less follow-up than was in the previously presented data um, from the soft and text investigators. And here is what they showed. First, aromatase inhibitor improved recurrence and distant recurrence over tamoxifen, but did not improve overall survival. Secondly, the recurrence benefit for, for aromatase inhibitor was seen regardless of nodal status. So this was seen in both patients who were node negative and in patients who had one to three positive nodes. Third, the benefit of AI came with minimal increase in fractures and no increase in non-breast cancer deaths. Now let's move on to our expander and an update of this analysis, um, otherwise known as the SWOG S1007 study. So the initial results of our expander showed us that chemotherapy benefit differs by menopausal status for patients who have an oncotype recurrence score of less than or equal to 25. Postmenopausal patients have no benefit to chemotherapy in either IDFS or distant relapse-free survival, DRFS. Premenopausal patients all benefited from chemotherapy. So the questions that are addressed by this analysis were these. Do these findings hold for distant relapse-free interval as the outcome? Remember, this includes only distant recurrence and deaths from breast cancer, does not include local regional, second primaries, or non-breast cancer deaths. Do these findings hold for patients who have micrometastases? And were the findings modified by adjuvant menstrual status, meaning in patients who had chemotherapy-induced amenorrhea or ovarian function suppression, were we still seeing a benefit from chemotherapy? Or was the chemotherapy effect all due to amenorrhea? So just to remind you, here's the R expander schema for patients who were ER positive and or PR positive, one to three positive lymph nodes, had a recurrence score between zero and 25, and were randomized either to chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. Now, here are the new analyses. First, distant relapse-free interval stratified by menopausal status. What you see on the left, postmenopausal patients DRFI does not show a chemotherapy benefit, so this is consistent with the earlier findings. And on the right, in premenopausal patients, DRFI does show an absolute chemotherapy benefit of 2.4%. So this also shows a benefit consistent with earlier findings from this study. Secondly, the question of micrometastases. So looking at premenopausal patients, on the left with micrometastases. There were 206 patients in this group, and we saw a five-year IDFS absolute chemotherapy benefit of 7.3%. Compare that to patients who were N1, and that benefit was only 4.8%. So benefit preserved in patients who have micrometastases. And then finally, the amenorrhea question. So first, does OFS provide similar benefit to chemotherapy in endocrine therapy uh, in the endocrine therapy only arm? That is shown below. And what you see there is that there is no benefit um, to chemotherapy um, in these patients when you compare those with OFS and those without OFS. Second question, does amenorrhea provide similar benefit to chemotherapy in the endocrine therapy only arm? Maybe. Uh, what you see on the right, chemotherapy induced amenorrhea for the endocrine therapy only arm above, there is a difference, and chemo than endocrine therapy, there is a small difference. However, these are non-significant differences. These are post hoc analyses, and ovarian function suppression was not randomized. Furthermore, the trial was not powered to answer these questions. So this is provocative data, but not definitive. So in summary, for endocrine therapy, ovarian function suppression, menopausal status, and recurrence score, the 13-year update of SOFT and TEX showed us that patients with ER-positive high-risk early breast cancer continue to relapse over time. Ovarian function suppression confers an overall survival benefit to women at high risk, regardless of endocrine therapy choice, and that benefit is about 10%. Low risk women, in the data I didn't show you, do well regardless of whether they have ovarian function suppression. And when given ovarian function suppression, 
AI, in this case, exemestane, outperforms tamoxifen by about 3.3% for overall survival at 12 years. When we look at the Oxford overview data, we saw that regardless of nodal status, AI reduces recurrence over tamoxifen. But in this data set, there was no overall survival benefit seen. There was a minimal cost to giving AI over tamoxifen in terms of fracture or early non-breast cancer mortality. And then finally, looking at the R responder data for women with node positive tumors with an oncotype recurrence score of, at least of 25 or less, we saw that adjuvant chemotherapy improved DRFI in premenopausal women by about 2.4%, but not in postmenopausal women. The benefits in premenopausal women extended to those with micrometastatic disease in the nodes. We saw about a 7.3% benefit there. And in a post hoc non randomized analysis, Ovarian function suppression did not provide a similar benefit to chemo, but those with chemo-induced amenorrhea after chemotherapy had numerically better outcome with endocrine therapy alone. Moving on now, let's talk about the data for CDK4-6 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting. And there's been a clear rationale for why we thought these drugs might provide benefit in this setting. We know that approximately 20% of patients who have hormone receptor positive HER2 negative early breast cancer will experience a disease recurrence in the first 10 years, and 50% of all these recurrences are in the first five years. Loss of, of control of the cell cycle is a hallmark of hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and CDK4-6 inhibitors have been shown to reestablish control of this checkpoint through G1 arrest. CDK4-6 inhibitors with endocrine therapy in the first line and in pretreated settings in metastatic disease have had dramatic improvements that have changed the natural history, including prolonging progression-free survival, overall survival, and they are well tolerated with uh, a really good quality of life. So at San Antonio this year, we saw the um, full analysis of the PALIS trial. So PALIS was the phase three study of adjuvant palbociclib, and you can see the eligibility criteria on the left. These patients were stage two or three, uh, they had to be enrolled within 12 months of diagnosis and within six months of starting adjuvant endocrine therapy. 5,600 patients were enrolled. There was a stage 2A cohort that was limited to 1,000 patients, and these patients were randomized to uh, endocrine therapy with or without the addition of palbociclib for two years. Palbociclib was given at the standard dose of 125 milligrams daily, three weeks on, one week off. The ultimate primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival. Now, these are the results for the primary endpoint of IDFS. At four years, there was no significant difference between the group that received two years of palbociclib and the group that received endocrine therapy alone, with their respective IDF estimates of 84.2% and 84.5%, a hazard ratio of 0.96, which was non-significant. This confirms the earlier findings that were seen when the second interim analysis was announced in the summer of 2020. You'll recall at that time, there was a pre-planned interim analysis and the trial had crossed the futility boundary. Additional follow-up continued and with the full number of events, uh, that negative uh, result is now confirmed at 31 months. Here are the secondary endpoints of invasive breast cancer-free survival and distant relapse-free survival. And again, you see that at four years, we do not see a benefit to adding two years of palbociclib to endocrine therapy. So here summarizes what we know so far about the adjuvant trials of CDK4-6 inhibitors. You can see that we have four different trials. I just told you about the updated results of the PALIS trial at 31 months, a negative trial. At ESMO, earlier this year, we saw the final results of Monarchy with 27 months of follow-up. Monarchy is a positive trial. Endocrine therapy alone, uh, IDFS at three years was 83.4%, which increased to 88.8% with two years of abemocyclib. So that was a significant hazard ratio of 0.70, a positive trial for abemocyclib. We also have the Penelope B trial, which was presented at last year's San Antonio, 42.8 months of follow-up. 
And this also was a negative trial. Uh, Penelope B was palbociclib given for one year in patients with high risk residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, so this is a different patient population, uh, but this was also a negative trial. Natalie, the fourth trial, which is looking at three years of ribocyclib, has not yet read out. So why do we see these differences in adjuvant, adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor trials, particularly now the final analyses of PALIS and Monarchy showing PALIS to be a negative trial, Monarchy to be a positive trial? Well, there are several postulated differences, which really, uh, at this point, it's hard to say what the true uh, explanation is. There are several po uh, possibilities. First, there are population differences and the follow-up is short. This is important because this is a disease with a long natural history. Monarchy had a patient population that was of higher risk than that in Palace. There was no stage 2A cohort within the Monarchy trial. And in fact, Monarchy reached all of the events needed by only 19 months of follow-up. So that tells us that that was a very high risk population of patients who had very early relapses. Now, Penelope B, also a high risk population, was a negative trial. But remember that it did show a difference at two years that disappeared at the four year follow up time. So potentially, we are just seeing with Monarchy e, treatment of occult or early micrometastatic disease that persisted at the time of diagnosis rather than uh, the impact on true um, dormancy and a minimal residual disease. There could also be an impact of discontinuation or tolerability because we did see that there was uh, quite a high discontinuation rate with the PALIS trial. However, uh, we've done an analysis of the PALIS trial showing no difference by adherence status, and that was published earlier this year in JCO. And we do know that there are pharmacological differences between palbociclib and abemocyclib in terms of its their selective selectivity and potency against different CDKs. And there's a, also an important difference in the schedule. Abemocyclib is given on a continuous schedule, where, whereas palbociclib is given on an intermittent schedule. And we know that the effects on the cell cycle are actually easily reversible when patients stop taking the drug. So, perhaps it's necessary to have continuous suppression of the cell cycle, uh, such as one would receive with a bemocyclib, uh, and uh, maybe that made the difference. And then finally, the tumor aggressiveness in these patient populations. There may be a very big difference in how these drugs work in endocrine-sensitive versus endocrine-resistant patients. We know that abemocyclib has endo endocrine therapy-independent effects. It is approved as a single agent uh, in metastatic disease. We also know that in the metastatic trials, palbociclib seemed to work best in patients who developed endocrine resistance. So potentially, palbociclib could work better in late, preventing late recurrence after um, residual tumor cells developed resistance to adjuvant endocrine therapy. And there could have been differences in biology in the intrinsic subtypes in the tumors uh, and the proportion of patients with different intrinsic subtypes. And we've seen in the metastatic setting that that can have a big impact on whether or not the tumors will respond. So I think only time will tell whether, uh, whether these differences continue to persist with longer follow-up um, uh, as we move on. And finally, with my last few minutes, I wanna highlight a couple of the metastatic disease trials that were shown at San Antonio. So first, the PADA-1 trial, which is fulvestrin and palbociclib uh, versus continuing AI and palbociclib upon detecting circulating ESR1 mutations. So the PADA-1 trial uh, was designed with the recognition that ESR1 mutations develop in response to aromatase inhibitor treatment and can confer resistance to endocrine therapy. Patients on uh, AI and CDK4 four, six inhibitor combinations for metastatic disease will all develop resistance eventually. But we really often don't know whether that resistance is to the endocrine therapy or to the CDK4-6 inhibitor. So the rationale for the PADA-1 trial was to monitor patients who were on a combination of AI and CDK for metastatic disease. And if those patients developed a circulating ESR1 mutation, 
that was detectable, they um, might be immediately randomized to either continue AI or switch to fulvestrant. And all of the patients would continue their CDK4-6 inhibitor. So the goal here was to determine whether an early switch at the time of detecting an ESR1 mutation could prevent or delay clinical tumor progression in the metastatic setting. On the left, you can see the inclusion criteria for the trial. So these patients could not have relapsed while on their AI or within 12 months of completing their adjuvant AI. They could not have had any prior systemic therapy for metastatic breast cancer, and they had to have measurable or evaluable disease. You see the schema on the right. So in these first line metastatic patients, all of them started AI and palbociclib, and they were monitored um, by having their blood checked for an ESR1 mutation through CT DNA analysis uh, but at inclusion at one month and then every two months. For patients who had a rising ESR1 mutation and no uh, synchronous clinical progression of disease, they were randomized to either continue their AI and palbociclib or to switch to fulvestrant and palbociclib. ESR1 monitoring looked at all of the relevant targets um, in terms of the ESR1 mutation. There were over 12,000 samples analyzed in real time at two different uh, sites. And uh, the patients were stratified on their time from inclusion to rising uh, ESR1 mutation detection in the presence of visceral metastases. Now, importantly, patients who had continued on the AI plus palbociclib and progressed had the opportunity to cross over to fulvestrant. So we have data on those patients as well. Those patients crossed over at the time of clinical progression. The co-primary endpoints in the trial were safety and investigator assist, assessed progression-free survival. This was an event-driven analysis and it required 120 PFS events uh, in step two. So 200 patients had to be randomized in step two, and they anticipated 1,000 patients had to be included in step one to yield 200 patients in step two. And here are the results for the primary analysis of progression-free survival after randomization. And what you can see here uh, is that a median follow-up of 26 months, uh, the uh, median progression-free survival for patients who stayed on the palbociclib and AI was only 5.7 months compared to 11.9 months for patients who switched to fulvestrant at the detection of ESR1 mutation. This uh, yielded a hazard ratio of 0.63 and a stratified hazard ratio of 0.61, which was statistically significant. It was an absolute difference of 6.2 months in the amount of time patients continued to respond. Now, if we compare that to the patients who went on to second line therapy after clinical progression, there was only a progression free survival when patients switched to fulvestrant of 3.5 months. So clearly they gained more time uh, when, they moved, when they switched early in the presence of the ESR1 mutation than if they waited for clinical progression. And then lastly, the EMERALD trial, which is a trial of the new oral CERD elicestrant um, versus investigator's choice of endocrine therapy in advanced and metastatic breast cancer. This is the EMERALD phase three trial. So elicestrant is an oral CERD that blocks estrogen receptor, inhibits estradiol-dependent gene transcription induction and cell proliferation. It's been seen to be highly effective in breast cancer cell lines with better efficacy than fulvestrant. And you can see the data from the phase one trials below showing uh, that postmenopausal women with ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer uh, demonstrated uh, actually fair amount of activity uh, with the single agent with um, confirmed partial responses in these heavily pretreated patients as in both those who'd had a prior CDK4-6 inhibitor as well as those who'd had prior, prior fulvestrant and those who harbored ESR1 mutations. So these are, of course, all of the relevant patients who in whom we're looking for new therapies. This is the design of the Emerald Phase three trial. It was a randomized trial in these patients who'd progressed or relapsed on or after one or two lines of endocrine therapy for advanced disease, one of which was given in combination with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. 
There were 477 patients who were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either a lacestrant at 400 milligrams a day or the investigator's choice of standard of care endocrine therapy listed there, fulvestrant, anastrozole, letrozole, or exemestane. Patients were then followed to progression uh, with co-primary endpoints of progression-free survival in all patients and progression-free survival in patients who had mutations in ESR1. The trial had 90% power to detect a PFS hazard ratio of 0.667 in all patients and 80% power for a hazard ratio of 0.61 in those with mutations in ESR1. And here's the primary endpoint in all patients intend to treat. Elicestrant had a median progression-free survival of 2.79 months and standard of care had only a progression-free survival of 1.91 months. Now, this was a statistically significant finding uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.69. And the presenter presented this as a 30% reduction in the risk of progression or death. I would say that looking at the, um, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves with uh, light blue standard of care and green elicestrant, one might also think that this is not quite what we typically see in these patients um, with very short progression-free survival actually in both of the arms and particularly short progression-free survival in the control arm. In addition, despite the fact that this was a statistically significant hazard ratio, there was really uh, less than a month of difference in the median progression-free survival between the arms. And in tumors that were harboring ESR1, uh, again, we saw a difference favoring elicestrant uh, with a median progression-free survival of 3.78 months and standard of care only 1.87 months. Again, this was a, um, a, a significant hazard ratio of 0.546, but again, I would, I would hazard that the standard of care arm did particularly poorly in this trial. We did see a benefit in all of the clinically relevant subgroups in favor of elicestrant. And the other uh, endpoint uh, being safety, this is a very safe drug. And one can see that there are very few um, grade three or four treatment related AEs, um, essentially uh, uh, no fatal AEs, uh, only three serious AEs, and very few AEs leading to dose reduction. So take home messages from my presentation about ER positive disease at San Antonio in 2021. First, with regard to adjuvant endocrine therapy in premenopausal women. Chemotherapy remains standard for all premenopausal node positive women. And despite PERSH not being able to accrue uh, 20 years ago, we now are ready to test the question of whether ovarian function suppression provides the same benefits as chemotherapy. And we will have a trial coming within the NCT and cooperative groups. In soft and text for high risk premenopausal women, ovarian function suppression plus AI still provides the greatest degree of benefit in both reducing recurrence and improving survival. If one does give tamoxifen, it should be given with ovarian function suppression. In the Oxford overview, we saw similarly that AI provides further reduction in recurrence over tamoxifen. We did not see an overall survival benefit in the Oxford overview. And differences in these two analyses in terms of the overall survival benefit are not fully clear, but could have to do with the differences in the patient populations. Remember, we added additional patients into the Oxford overview, and there were differences in the length of follow-up. There also could have been differences in the use of ovarian function suppression um, between the two data sets, and we need longer follow-up to really be able to see whether there will truly be an overall survival benefit uh, in the Oxford overview. With regard to adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitors, the PALACE four-year analysis with a full number of events continues to show no benefit to the addition of two years of palbocyclib to endocrine therapy. Now, the stage 2A cohort with 1,000 patients will read out in 2022, and so we're interested in seeing that analysis in patients with more indolent disease. And translational studies are underway to identify any biological subsets that might benefit from palbocyclib. But at this time, abemocyclib 
remains the only CDK4-6 inhibitor that is approved in the adjuvant setting in those with high-risk disease based on the results of the Monarchy trial. And then finally, with regard to new therapies in ER-positive metastatic disease, we know that resistance mechanisms are important. What they are and how we should respond to them uh, is an ever-evolving uh, issue, and we need new treatment strategies in this setting. There is potential utility to identifying emerging ESR1 mutations based on the POTA1 results, but I would venture to say that we need more rational switching studies for patients who progress on a CDK4-6 inhibitor who may have one of any number of different uh, mechanisms for resistance in either the endocrine therapy or the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And then finally, new oral SIRDs may be able to overcome ESR1 mutation resistance or mechanisms of CDK4-6 inhibitor resistance, and we're awaiting data on many of these agents that are still in the pipeline. I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, do they need to be a lot better than what we already have, or do they just need to be active so that we have another option for these patients? And uh, if they have better quality of life because they're oral and don't require an injection, that could be a real plus. They may also be easier to combine with other therapies. So I think the jury is still out on how much benefit we will see from oral SIRDs. We anxiously await additional data on other agents in this class. And with that, I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you so much.